Our, our third presentation is from uh, from David Mitchell, who is a quantity of art. Um, it's interesting, I reflect more, more and more about the changing in our quantities of value. If I had a stereotype over the last 50 years of, of practicing in this business, um, quantity surveyors were tended to be down, conservative, focused on numbers and so forth. But we've got people like David who come along who have a total different, different perspective about it. They've, they've redefined the role of a quantity surveyor to a large extent, and that's exciting because they're getting to the things that really matter to clients. He's got always got a very interesting presentation. I ask you to welcome David to uh, to share with us what you're going to talk about. Thanks, Tom, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, we've heard what estimators are like, so architects drive saabs and wear bow ties. <laughs> um, um, what I what I want to talk about today is um, a change in the marketplace. Um, We've, we've known for a long time that the construction industry isn't very efficient, and there's a lot of metrics that go to support this. Um, recent events in the world economy, though, have started, have started to cause change. So um, our construction businesses in Australia are now exposed to world labour costs, and they're also exposed to cheaper manufacturing and prefabrication techniques. Um, and it's this type of thing that's connecting together to help, help businesses make this decision that there must be a better way. Um, now, BIM seems set to be one of the enablers for this new game. Um, there's a big problem, though. While we know a lot about 3D um, and how to put models together, there's not a lot of discussion and there's not a lot of knowledge in the area of 4D linking of time and 5D linking of costs. Um, and yes, we do have different definitions of what 5D is. Um, to me, it's, uh, I don't need a time program to be able to estimate from a model. 5D to me simply is when I estimate from a model. Um, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on today. Now, in terms of in the marketplace um, and where 5D first got defined, um, it's in the US. And there it's referred to as quantity takeoff. Um, now, I think that understates the exercise because if it's just about um, uh, taking off quantities, then we don't know the cost of a project until the model's complete. Um, and that's too late. The other thing is, is the estimator doesn't sit at the same table as the designers and the owner, um, and the, the process is not transparent, so there's not trust within it. So what I think is um, an alternative approach and a better approach is to have a 5DQS or an estimator, or whatever you want to call him, um, be able to pull information from the model at the time that he needs it and then push back data that's at the right time for the design team and owners to be able to receive that information. Um, a process like that means that um, designs can be tested, the efficiency of the design can be tested in the very early phases before models have started um, and that's when we have the best opportunity to influence cost. Once things are fully designed it's very, very difficult. Um, the other thing is, is you can set up an estimating system that, that is, uh, gets rerun constantly. So you end up with this, this notion of real-time real feedback on what cost is doing as design changes. Um, and there's big benefits that come out of that. So when I look at those two things alone, um, I think it starts to create better buildings because you have money targeted at the most important design features. Um, so there's not money tucked away in some concept um, uh, where people are not aware what the something is going to cost. When you have transparency about where money is, then you get trust. And trust is what we need on construction projects. It's actually what breaks things down. The reason why we can't collaborate is because we don't trust. Um, and money is a key to this. So the more we talk about money, the better we can, we can move into these places. Now, for BIM to be truly successful, it needs to deliver on all of the Ds. So, Today, what I'm going to talk about is firstly about how uncertain construction costs are and then what sort of certainty might we be able to achieve. So we'll just talk about the context of that. Um, then I want to talk about uh, setting up saving strategies. What are the types of things that you need to know if you want to save money through BIM? Um, we'll look at some of the, the skills that a 5DQS needs. Um, I'll show you a uh, concept of what a, a, a 5D BIM execution plan looks like. And then I want to show you um, some work that we've done recently on Sunshine Coast Public University Hospital as a bit of a demonstration. Um, so in terms of uncertainty, um, it's pretty much accepted that 
if you're going to build something, it'll cost more money than what you thought, and it will take longer. Um, and that's pretty much a view that is worldwide. Uh, I travel the world looking at these particular things, and it's a common expectation, even in places where labour is very cheap. So in India, they expect their projects to blow out by 60%. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a common thing. So there's research that backs this up. Some very interesting research here in Australia was done in Victoria. It was done just on Alliance projects. Why I find it interesting is because Alliance is one of the closest things we have to IPD and it's billed as being uh, what will deliver BIM. Um, and there's some pretty big problems with it. So the, this, that research found that from the business case to when the uh, total outturn cost estimate is put together, they get a change in price of between 35 and 45%, which is pretty significant. There's key fundamental reasons why that occurs, but then once the top is, is um, established, the actual cost will then be around about 5 or 10% more than that. And that's across every alliance project in Victoria. Um, around the world, um, there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of research into this, but this one guy, he looked at 260 projects across 20 co uh, countries. So not a big sample um, when you think about the worldwide sense, but what his observation was 90% 90 90 of projects had cost overruns, and those overruns were in the order of 30%. Um, and it, if you continue to research this thing like I have, because I'm always looking at things like uh, any numbers on return on investment, this is what you will commonly find. So what I did was I was interested in what happens here in Brisbane. Right? So I took 1,100 projects in Mitchell Brentman's Brisbane office and I analysed what happened with costs. Um, because we do track every job. So in terms of, we look at all the performance on every job and then we reuse it at the beginning to be able to do things in a better way. So across 1,100 projects where we just uh, have a watching brief for finances, so these are all privately funded projects, um, the range in costs were from minus 13% up to plus 321. There was one that was 1,087. A bit terrible. Um, um, but the thing is, is on average, it was only about a 7% growth. Now, there's no quantity surveyors on these projects. There's no cost management. It's actually just the way private construction is done. Um, so it's developers doing what they do. Um, the difficulty with that is one in four projects has a chance of being more than 5% over budget. And that destroys feasibility studies. So when you talk about risk, that's not so certain. Um, what's interesting in those, in those um, areas is that 64% of those contracts are lump sum. Um, a big area of construction is actually owner builders that are not talked about a lot. Um, and almost 60% of that work is residential. And residential is by far the biggest part of the Australian construction industry. So we spend a lot of time talking about hospitals and airports and stuff like that. But Resi is actually by far the biggest market, and how this is just looking at apartments, and housing is bigger than that again. So it was excellent hearing about the story before. Um, so that's, an, that's a, an idea of how uncertain things are. Um, so there's an expectation that perhaps it could be around about 30%. When we look at the reality on private enterprise type projects, it's, it's better than that, but it's not great. Um, so now I want to turn to is what's possible. Um, and this is a project I love, right? And I love it because it happened at a particular point in time where something, and, and something happened that was organic. Um, and it's, the, it's at South Bank. Um, it's the Stokehouse restaurant and the buildings associated with that. And basically what happened there was um, the project was designed maybe five or six years ago. Uh, there were a bunch of consultants that just agreed to model. There were no BIM execution plans, that sort of thing. Then we basically just worked together and kind of did what we did. Um, <clears throat> that modelling information had no value to the contractor, but what happened organically was the structural steel guy got a hold of that model, and then he used it to be able to build his fabrication model. Um, when he performed the construction, it followed straight through as it planned, and then in terms of the change in dollars on that project, it was a very different story. So for this one project, structural steel was around about 15% of the work. Um, on the main contract, there was, or well, on, on the balance of the work, there was a change in time of 60%, there was a change in the lump sum price of almost 30%. 
From a client's perspective, they were still okay because it was under budget. But this is where cost management is bizarre. Basically what kept that project right was a healthy contingency and a low bid contractor, and that seems like a silly way to manage costs. Um, so where we want to head is to where there's more certainty. Um, the structural steel side of things, it had no delays, and it had just five variation claims that were all resolved before he started construction. Um, so the costs that were there were minimal, they avoided rework and that type of thing. Now, I'm doing more research on this sort of stuff at the moment, but the problem with working out savings and return on investment in construction is you never build the same thing twice. Uh, for Simmons, it might be different because you're building same style of houses, but in this type of stuff, you don't get to build that same thing twice, um, and that makes it difficult. So, if I want to make savings in BIM, and I want to introduce that to my project, how do I go about it? Um, the first thing is, is we need to understand some stuff about costs, and we also need to understand some basic stuff about contracting. The first thing is, is where money is. So, for the owners in the room, they concentrate a lot on head contractors and these massive uh, uh, margins that they have, the reality is that the bulk of the cost of a project is actually controlled by subcontractors. Their margins are around about seven to eight times what the head contractor is, and these are the people that are actually need to be engaged in the process. It's their information that needs to be brought forward um, and, and, and start to invest in, in, this, um, in this new field. When we look at the savings, so a common argument or a common discussion I get involved in in the marketplace is that the owner should pay for BIM because he's going to benefit from it. That's just absolute crap. The people that are going to benefit from it are actually the people that are going to do the work. Now if I go along to a subcontractor and I say this is a BIM project, you must be cheaper, <laughs> he's going to look at me like a fool. Um, he will put his old price on it and if it works out more efficient, he's going to be the one who gains from it. The client won't see anything from this. So when we're thinking about saving strategies for projects, we need to think about different perspectives, we need to think about what point we're introducing that strategy, and we need to think about contracts. Now this is a complicated table, but it was my thinking uh, over the last few years. Um, but anyway, we're talking about a contract point here of a head contract, another contract point of a subcontract, and then I've got various saving strategies down the left-hand side. Now they all fall into things like do something more efficient or make design documents better and that creates certainty. And that those things are no different to what we've done in the past. 2D versus 3D, they're the same issues that are going to generate savings. So when we looked at structural steel, it would fit in here. Level of development 300 and it's about creating more accurate for construction documents. Green means more saving, red means a little bit of saving and white means you get nothing. Designers pretty much get nothing. Um, so it doesn't really make sense that designers be investing in BIM for down the line uh, because it's, it's not there. Really what we need is a system where designers are setting up the system and then they can pass it on and we start to get information flowing down the, um, the contract, uh, down the supply chain. People are contributing information to there that is for their own, that's going to benefit themselves. Um, having, uh, having stuff done up here at the design end doesn't work. But the structural steel guy, he basically, you know, he, he benefit. If there was an efficiency there and a saving, he got that because there was a subcontract formed. And in terms of the owner, he didn't get a claim that he didn't know he was going to get, which is really hard to sell in a return on investment type discussion. Um, really what we're talking about is owners will have less contingency. Um, and it's getting metrics about those. So there's some things. Now this is um, uh, my concept of basically just take the time to plan to build. So it's do what that structural steel subcontractor did. Um, from a consultant point of view, it's get our models together, work in a federated way, do clash, coordinate those documents as best as we can, accept that we can't produce construction documents. It's actually for someone else to do that but we do the best that we can and then we pass it on. If it's a hard dollar um, um, uh, type approach, which we know 64% of projects are, then it's up to the contractor. So we pick our preferred bidder and then have the contractor do some work. He engages his subcontractors in that, 
in terms of the work that he needs to do. It's about coordination again. It's about clashing that job again because what he sees is something that's very different to what the designers see. It's different perspectives. Once he starts attaching um, activities and rates to this, he starts to understand what that job's really about. When we used to do this in the 2D world, it just wasn't possible. There were too many documents, too, too many specifications. In terms of running these sorts of queries on projects now, it takes hours and a day and that sort of thing. It doesn't matter how big it is. Um, so we can work through it. If we can start to engage the subcontractors, this is the real um, challenge, and perhaps that can be going back to an old school idea of nominated subcontractors, which was ditched. Uh, because of the risks of choosing subcontractors for builders. I wonder now, in the future, whether that actually has less risk than not engaging them at all. Um, so it's a possibly, yeah, go back to what we already know. Um, but this con concept of plan to build, so don't rush and get on site. As soon as you get on site, if you don't know what it is you're going to build, you're going to start losing money. Um, so basically, take the time to work it out. In terms of the construction itself, it's really about being lean. Now, lean is something that has also been developing around the world um, for a long time. It comes out of manufacturing, but it's had some pretty good weight in the last decade. Um, basically, it's one of these other enablers, and it's about reducing waste in construction. Um, now, a bit like we know construction projects will cost more. We also know that we throw away a pack of plasterboard on every level of the building. Um, but when you look at is there waste on a job, nobody can really find it. What I found was a report out of the WA. One of my colleagues shared this with me, and it's very, very cool. It's the best explanation of lean that I've ever had. Um, all of the other stuff, or that I've ever read, all of the other stuff is very academic. Um, it comes out of manufacturing and it's hard to understand. These guys actually defined waste and it's the first time I've seen it. They had seven categories. I've grouped two together and made it five. But basically, weighting and, uh, and rework is what we need to concentrate on cutting out. Um, and that's what worked for that steely. Understanding how the thing was going to be fabricated, steel arrives at the right time, they put it up, and they're not waiting for things to happen. So they're the types of things that I think need to be involved in a strategy. In terms of the QS, um, and a modern QS, the skills that he needs, um, these are some of them. So the first one is the ability to pull information from a model. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's an architectural model, a structural model, or a civil model. You need the skill to be able to pull this information from a model. Most pieces of software can do this extremely well. Um, so that's a fairly basic skill. The excuse of it's not classified right or um, it's not in the way I want to see it isn't valid. Basically, you need to be able to get information from whatever format that it's in. The next thing is improve the information. Now, we use Costex, that's no secret. We use other platforms as well, but Costex is by far the one we're best at because we've been using it for the longest. What we can do with Costex is we can actually add parameters into the, in, into the Costex file that allows us to filter information in a different way. Again, this isn't very difficult to do. What is difficult to do is work out what parameters you really need. Um, and that comes down to mapping. Mapping is basically really complicated formulas, and we've now got formula geeks in our office. We sit around, we don't measure stuff, we're working out different formulas of calculating these crazy things. How we can filter information in different ways. What filters we need to put in place to be able to make that work. Um, and basically, we measure elementally. We don't measure by trades. This is something we've, we learned a long time ago. Um, and it's more effective for us to do it that way. When we map, we map a, de we map a quantity and we map a description. So while... Um, there may not be a description in the model that says this is an XYZ. If you take different pieces from different places and assemble it right, you'll get the right description. It may not be what you're used to seeing in a um, standard method bill, but it's enough to get the, uh, the, um, uh, just what your intent is across the line. In terms of bills, I mean, this is one and how it looks. Breaking stuff up by levels is extremely easy. Um, uh, we can provide much more detail than what we've ever provided before. The main reason why we only wrote one item for, say, um, concrete columns is because we used to handwrite it when the standards were written. Um, and basically that took a long time. You'd handwrite it and then it was typed up. 
Nowadays, because we can map it at whatever level we want, it doesn't matter. When we're looking at detail, if a subcontractor that's doing the formwork wants to know the quantity of formwork in the different types of um, uh, column sizes, you can drive that out of the same map. So the idea is, is the map starts off uh, a general sort of map and it gets more detailed. You work on it more and more and more. So that ultimately it's answering the question across a project of whatever a quantity is. The more we rely on models, the more we need to know that they're correct. So being able to validate models is really important. Relying on uh, the designers to do it is okay, um, but they see different things to what estimators and quantity surveyors see. Um, what we're interested in is stuff that isn't modelled. We use Celebri, and this is one example. Um, we use Celebri because it's better at looking for stuff that isn't there. Um, whereas if there's a clash, usually it doesn't affect the quantities. Um, um, we're more interested in where there's misses or where there's um, where too much of something. What you can do when you find an error of that is say, oh, well, this model's no good, I'm not going to look at it, that's wrong. What you need to do is rely on the model for the quantity that it has and use a workaround to be able to adjust that quantity. That way, when you rerun the estimate next time, it's going to update automatically. Um, if you can't do that, you're going to be remeasuring things manually and that takes too long. Another skill to be using is the ability to be able to push information back. So we add parameters in, they're important to us. They may be important to other people down the supply chain. So being able to export those parameters. Um, uh, we, for Revit, we use a product called BIMLink. Export, um, export into Excel, bring it into BIMLink, and then push it back into the native file so that you're improving the information. I mean, that way the QS is actually collaborating with the rest of the design team, and it's a cool thing to do. Revisioning, I'll, get, I'll show you an example of this on Sunny Coast. Um, but basically it doesn't matter what the model is, this is a cost X view, it does this very, very well in terms of comparing one model to another. We can see changes and then we can produce reports precisely of what it is. The way you use that stuff is in negotiations um, um, or justifying price changes. And again, it's a very strong tool. It comes down to um, creating transparency and cost because it takes scope off the table. I've never seen two QSs in, the, in a room agree the same quantity. Everyone, they can measure something and they all come up with different answers, um, and they're all wrong. Um, um, at this type of methodology takes that issue um, off the table. In terms of um, how we apply it, um, it's about having an execution plan. So, Yes, we need to understand what we're doing as, as 5D QSs, but also the people um, that we're working with need to understand what we're doing because there's lots and lots of options. Um, for a project that comes down to an execution plan, um, basically, my nutshell version of that is that it's about getting a process, mapping it together with a behaviour, and then mapping it together with a deliverable through technology. So we hear things like BIM is technology, or BIM is a, a new way of being, that type of thing. It's actually all three. Um, so you need to have a process so you know you can deliver it. You've got to behave in an open way, and you've got to know what it is that you're actually delivering. Um, from a QS point of view, it's important. Our behaviour sometimes is one way. When we're pushing information back, it's actually two way, and it's more engaging. Um, this same thing applies for every subcontractor on the job. So when we're looking at different people adding information to the model, they need to be working in that same sort of um, um, schematic. In terms of the quantity surveyor, he needs to understand what his workflow is. It starts at the very beginning. Um, basically, our old school services still fit in this new world. We still do schematic design estimates. We still do develop design estimates. It's just that it's working from different types of information. Um, in terms of our biggest thing that we do, it's this one. Work the concept. So if we can drive the functional efficiency of a project, you will make the biggest uh, uh, effect on that project that you could do. The idea here is to make big decisions at the beginning, um, get those changes working down a funnel as we know as we know more information, these decisions at the other end are fine-tuning. In the old world, we would usually go out to tender, find out we've got a problem, and then start deleting carpet and landscaping and yada, yada, yada. Getting that job back on track is really, really difficult to do. Um, in terms of what it looks like, um, 
This is our document that we use. So one, we've got a workflow. Then we've got a step-by-step, -step, um, basically, we attach this to our fee quotes. Um, it's what we use in our office to uh, understand where we are on our workflow. It's how we manage the project. It's part of the BIM execution plan. The idea here is everybody knows precisely what it is that we're going to do. There's nothing worse than saying, I'm going to BIM the bejesus out of this job, and then finding out that you were going to do one estimate, and the client was expecting you to do an estimate every three days. Um, so you need to be clear about what's being offered here, and it has to come down to a tick box type thing, and it works very well. In terms of a job, to give you a, um, an example, this was work that we did, or we're still doing, with Len Lease. Um, so the way we did this work was we co-located with Len Lease. So around about five MV guys got together with about four or five Len Lease guys, and we worked in their office. So we actually took our computers, our licenses, that sort of thing. We, net, we created a network within their, within their business and we started doing the work. Our overall guideline was Len Lease wanted to teach them how to fish rather than catch fish for them. Um, so basically we worked alongside them, showed them the way these things work, um, um, and then the, the knowledge transfers organically. And it's been extremely successful. In terms of what we had to deliver, um, and there were many things, but a key deliverable was being able to issue visual quantities to subcontractors. These were given to the subbies so that they could put their tender together. The concept was that if a, if a subbie could get a really clear understanding of what the scope was, and he could see how these big acres of work was going to be done on this project, it's a hundred, the main hospital, it's 185,000 square metres, um, then they would get a far more efficient price. So that was one thing. So the way we did that from Costex, we issued Costex reader files and, um, and the subbies were able to work with that information. The other thing they wanted was they wanted us to be able to revision it. The old school way of working is we'd freeze the documents, I don't know, six weeks out from tender. We continue to finish off our bill of quantities. By the time we issue our bill, the drawings have moved on. Clearly there's an undermeasure in the bill. Um, so you'd end up with errors that are between the bill and the design, mainly because they weren't done at the same time. With this sort of stuff, um, we, revisioned, uh, we revisioned the whole structural package in a day and a half? Day and a half. There we go. Um, yeah, incredibly fast. Now, that was something that we couldn't do in the, uh, in, in the old world. We would never be able to revision it. Um, the way that this looked um, is like this. So, in terms of the action, where we're at at the moment is we're one week out from tender on the structural packages. Um, so we've got basically our quantities together and we receive a new model. And this is in real time, but it doesn't include the rough checks. Um, so basically what we're doing here is we're bringing in the new version of the model. So you can see quantities here on the left, they're going to go to zero, um, basically because it's just comparing one model to the other at the moment. So our, our measurement is not lost, um, and we're able to start looking at what those changes are. Um, and it's a really, really cool feature that Costex has. I don't know whether RIB has it, I'm sure it has something similar. Um, um, but I know other pieces of software that have similar things, but this one is extremely cool. Um, in terms of getting a context of what those changes are. So yellow is changed. Um, now, in the manual world, if I got, this is one quarter of the job, if I got a quarter of the set of the drawings on the job that had changes across all of them like this, I panic, I reckon. <laughs> um, with this type of stuff, it was pretty cool. Um, so what we're doing at the moment is just getting a, a, a feel for what those changes are. In the real world, what's going on is we're actually doing rough checks and finding out and interrogating those changes that are showing up there. But in terms of now the, the calculation, we then promote that model um, and we start to get revised quantities coming through. Um, and it's this quick. So this is real time, it's not sped up. So the idea of the computation is it's extremely fast. Um, and we can produce a report that shows all of the changes throughout that bill of quantities. Um, where we're at at the moment is packages that are out, some have been let, 
So this is into a variation phase, others are still a tender, it's working into addendum phases, but you start to get bids that you're closing off on that you can rely on and you've got a much better certainty in. So in terms of the results of what we've been able to achieve on that project, so one thing is, is well, how good was the model? You know, how much, how much 2D measurement did you have to do versus 3D measurement? Because it just doesn't make sense to model everything, I don't, well, I don't think. Um, in terms of what we did, if we looked at um, what we turned out from 3D versus 2D, 94% of the cost of the packages came from 3D measurement, so it was automated and updatable. There was just 6% that came from the 2D point of view. When we look at the number of items, it's the reverse. Um, so we end up with like 40% of the 2D measurement is tied up um, in, in these uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of items. And this is where it's about rethinking how we measure, why we measure that type of thing into the future because we spend an awful lot of time measuring things that don't make a big difference on cost. They become very important when I see them in court, but at the time when someone's putting together a tender, they're like, meh, maybe not so important. Um, so these are the questions for the future, I think. So um, I hope I've given you some ideas um, and some, some uh, definition and context about what I think 5D is. Um, um, from my mind, I think this particular thing, having clarity and transparency about money, um, will generate better buildings. It does it because we make decisions earlier um, and it's transparent, so it creates trust. The third thing is, is we can do it a lot. So when we used to do one estimate and we got it right, what would have been maybe luck? When you do an estimate and you can do it 50 times after that, I tell you what, you get more accurate and better and better and better. Because the more you rehearse it, the better you get at it. Um, in terms of 5D itself and how we apply it, the skills, um, well, first of all, the technology, it's here, it's reliable, it's really, really cool stuff. It's very easy to teach and it's easy to learn the technology. Um, but the technology alone won't give the certainty that's needed. Um, that actually comes down to know-how. So it's how we use our wisdom, intelligence, and knowledge to leverage technology to come up with far better results. Um, so for my mind, this isn't a threat to estimators or quantity surveyors. It is an incredible enhancement tool. So thank you.